To those of you who are who are here, uh, welcome to the Eagle River Nature Center online. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Samantha Russell Blumenkerning. I'm the Chief Naturalist at the Eagle River Nature Center. Um, as the Eagle River Nature Center, even though I'm not physically there right now, um, we always like to start each program uh, recognizing, honoring, and celebrating that we get to exist on the historical home range of um, Athabascan people, a, a Denina people, um, a living nation whose generations upon generations of generations upon stewardship make the great place that we all love possible. Um, something else just right up front is unfortunately this year at the Eagle River Nature Center we were not able to have our annual fundraiser, our annual fall auction. Um, even though the main building is closed to the public, we're still making programs like this happen, we're still maintaining our trails, we're still you know, doing the best we can to make sure everybody has a positive Eagle River Nature Center experience. And we're asking um, if you're able to, um, to help us make up the money that we didn't make at the uh, fundraiser. And so I'm just posting a link uh, in the chat box so that we can make that happen as we go. I'm seeing some amazing young folks waving at us. Glad you guys are here with your snowy background. Glad you're here. Um, as we get going today, some of you might be interested in knowing that we do have a junior astronomer program. Um, if you're interested in learning more, have your fabulous adults send me an email at naturalist at ernc.org. I just put that in our chat box as well. Coming up at the Eagle River Nature Center on Sunday at 2 p.m., we have a biologist, Andrew Fisher, who's been learning about um, and studying saw wet owls at the Eagle River Nature Center. Um, and he'll be presenting his research and all sorts of trail camera work he's been doing. And that's coming up this Sunday at 2. One other big exciting thing happening at the Eagle River Nature Center is we have changed um, our parking situation. Um, it's called an Iron Ranger, the pay station, how it is, and we now have a fancy new one that can be used with credit cards. One trick and some feedback that I've received with that is it prompts you for your license plate number, so remember to tuck that away before you go up to pay. But with that, tonight's program is part of the astronomy series. We're super fortunate, and I have a feeling she is got distracted with one of her pets, but we have Omega Smith, who's with the UAA Planetarium, um, who's going to be talking about in, um, intergalactic oceans, basically. Um, as we go through this tonight, we have a small group. Um, feel free to ask questions as you have them by unmuting yourself. Um, please be a little bit mindful, though. Like, don't just jump right on top of every single thing that she's saying. Um, and then if you're unable to unmute yourself or if you don't have those capabilities, feel free to use the chat box and I'll be watching that and I can always pipe in on your behalf. Um, with that, we're so glad you came and I'm going to turn it over to Omega. All right. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Samantha. And hello, everybody. This is Omega Smith from the University of Alaska Planetarium and Visualization Theater. And I do recognize some of the people in the audience, some of our participants. So uh, good to see you guys, of course. Um, all right. So today I'm going to be talking about ocean worlds. Uh, there's been some tremendous discoveries happening just recently about water on other worlds besides Earth. So I'll talk um, about that as well as about the possibility of these ocean worlds harboring life off of Earth as well. So let me go ahead and take over the screen here. Okay. We should be good to go. All right, um, so let's go ahead and get started. So ocean worlds has become an amazing topic recently and it's a pretty new topic in astronomy, uh, especially because we are now finding more and more exoplanets, planets and solar systems beyond our own solar system. So this has really uh, immensely grown the topic of geology, astrogeology, and astrobiology. So the geological effects 
on different planets and different bodies beyond our own Earth and the possibility that those bodies, planets, moons, even asteroids, comets, might be able to harbor life or might actually have life already growing on there. So it wasn't even until 1995 that we actually discovered our first extrasolar planet. And considering that astronomy is the oldest science, that is a very recent development. So this topic has definitely been exploding in the last couple of decades. So I'm gonna start way at the beginning. Let's do uh, way back where this all started, kind of a crash course on what water is and where it came from. So it's important to know where water came from in order to figure out how water gets on a planet. So water is made up of two different kinds of molecules, two kinds of elements. It's hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, of course. And hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It started forming almost immediately after the Big Bang. So it is everywhere. Hydrogen is not a hard thing to find. It's already out there almost everywhere. And that's because it's the most simple element you can get. It's just one proton and one electron. Oxygen is a little bit more difficult. So oxygen is uh, something that has to be formed in a process that happens inside of stars. So it doesn't just happen out of the universe. Um, it's gotta be created. And we always like to call stars crucibles because you can actually create lots of different elements inside of stars. Oxygen, does begin fusion inside stars that are more massive than our own sun. So if you have a sun-like star, the mass of our, our sun, it's not really got enough mass to really have the energy to fuse oxygen and create oxygen. Um, but then there's plenty of stars that are larger than our own star, and those stars, the larger they are, the quicker they burn, um, the quicker they go through their life cycle, and Therefore, those stars have actually uh, gone through these fusion processes. And when they're done with their life cycle, they do something which is pretty spectacular, which is a supernova. So they expand their outer atmosphere and pretty much shed off a lot of the outer atmosphere. Um, and all the heavier elements that were created inside the star actually spread out throughout the universe and start what we like to call a seeding. They seed the nebulas around them and the airs around them, and those heavier elements can now be used to make a second generation of stars. And around those stars, you can even make planets. So once the hydrogen in that core of that star burns and expands out, it will interact with the hydrogen and therefore create H2O, which is water molecules. So, we can see this in a lot of what we call stellar nurseries, these amazing nebulae. And if you look down toward the bottom right of the screen, right here, this is the Orion Nebula. And this is what we call a stellar nursery, which is basically a place where stars are born. It's a gigantic cloud of mostly hydrogen gas. And the way we can tell that is by looking at the color of it. Hydrogen gas, when it gets excited, kind of like a neon light, it will reflect this beautiful kind of pinkish purplish color. And we see that a lot in these types of nebulae. The Orion Nebula is also one of particular interest to me because it is in the constellation of Orion, which is a wintertime constellation, which means up here in Alaska, we get to see it throughout all the winter. So it is one of the best constellations to see in the night sky, one of the most recognizable also and it's especially visible up at the Eagle River Nature Center. If you guys take a telescope up there, you can definitely see it up there on a clear night. Uh, and then you can see, if you look at the belt of Orion, which are the three stars that make up the belt, hanging down from the belt, there's three dimmer stars that line up similar to the belt. That center star is actually the Orion Nebula. And I kind of wish I had a little visualization for you there, but I forgot to put one in. So in that nebula, we have this whole process going. We have the larger stars, the big stars that form out of this gas cloud. This gas, mostly full of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, tiny bit of heavier elements, will slowly start collapsing down, forming stars. And all that material, you get some really big stars. Big stars burn hotter, which means they also burn faster. 
So those are the ones that are creating the heavier elements and they tend to go supernova first. So they don't take very long to cook up all those elements and explode and seed the rest of the galaxy or the rest of the nebula with those elements. So then while those elements are going back into that nebula, other stars are forming as well. So now we have those heavy elements going into other stars and solar systems forming, and then you get something like our solar system. So you have our sun, which is still mostly made up of hydrogen because hydrogen is very abundant, a little bit of helium, uh, and then you have the heavier elements that came from the other stars, the previous generation of stars in there too. And that's what really forms most of the heavier elements of the planets. And of course, if there's life on those planets, it would be in that life on that planet too. So this is where the water molecules come from. And while the star is forming, it is forming planets around it, we found that um, out of all the stars in our galaxy, there's probably an equal number of planets in our galaxy. So solar systems are not uncommon. We're finding more and more all the time. And I can't even remember the last time I looked it up, but there's probably a couple hundred more since I've looked it up last time. So the formation of the solar system is what really is the kind of trick on how this water, these water molecules that are just floating out in space get onto a body like a planet and create an ocean world. So when you look at our solar system, which is the best example we have, because it's the one we've been studying the longest, we see that we have the smaller planets are closer to the sun. These planets are terrestrial planets, which means they're mostly made up of rock, some metal, of course, there's a little bit of water. Um, and then the lighter elements tend to be further out in the solar system and be part of the bigger planets. So those are the gases and the ice crystals. So we have a lot of hydrogen, we have helium, we have crystallized methane and, and lighter elements like that tend to get pushed out. And the reason that is because when the star's first forming, like our star, it has solar winds, those amazing things that also make it so we can be uh, view the aurora on our planet. Those solar winds actually push the heavier elements further away and leave, or sorry, push the lighter elements further away and leave the heavier elements closer. One of the lighter elements is going to be water. So water does kind of get pushed further away. So water didn't really form on Earth like the rock formed on Earth, but instead it kind of got pushed into these leftover materials that didn't quite coalesce into a planet, and that is going to be the comets and asteroids of our solar system. So we see a lot of water ice in comets and asteroids. But of course, where our planets formed in our solar system has not always stayed the same. They tend to move. They do this kind of fun migration throughout the billions of years as they're orbiting around the sun. And due to that migration, some of those comets and asteroids come into the inner solar system and will collide with inner planets. That's where our oceans come from on Earth. So those asteroids that formed at the very beginning, these asteroids are 4.5 billion years old and remain pretty much untouched since the beginning of our solar system. Sometimes they get kicked around in their orbit because of planet migration or uh, just because they are gravitationally interacting with other objects and they will collide or coalesce with some other planets as well, including our inner planets. And there's enough water ice there for us to create large amounts of oceans, including the ones on Earth. So that is where Earth oceans come from. Now, Earth is known as a water planet or an ocean world. And that's because 71% of the surface is covered by water. However, not a lot of the mass of Earth is actually water. It's a 0.02%, I believe, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, but that's still a lot of water for how big our planet is. So it's about 326 million trillion gallons of water. And only about 3% of that is fresh water. So almost all of that is in our oceans. And uh, most of the fresh water we have is actually frozen in ice caps. So it's not even uh, surface fresh water that's flowing freely like in our lakes and streams and rivers. And um, our ocean world has changed over time and it is definitely st currently still changing. And a pretty 
incredible rate. So two thirds of Earth's fresh water is in the ice caps and glaciers, and those are melting at a pretty high rate. The Greenland ice sheet is melting at about 287 billion tons a year, and all that's gonna be going into our oceans. So we're gonna become even more of an ocean world as this continues. And that's in the Antarctic ice sheet is also um, melting at an incredible rate, which is 134 billion tons a year. So that is something to keep in mind when we look at ocean worlds too, is that ocean worlds aren't always exactly the way we see them now. As we study these new worlds that we're discovering, we have to look at what they might have been in the past and what they might be like in the future, very similar to our own Earth. So we can look at that looking at nearby planets to Earth as well, or even looking at the moon. So Earth's moon, we've actually made an amazing discovery. For a long time, we thought Earth's moon was just a barren place no liquid water at all, and pretty much geologically dead, which means there's no geological activity, that means there's no molten core, uh, there's no tectonic activity, there's no uh, movement on the surface. Uh, but we find a lot more about it. We do have moonquakes uh, that do happen, but it is pretty much geologically dead. So we were thinking since it's cold, it has no atmosphere. It'd be very hard for us to find any water, especially because if there were water on the surface, the sun would hit it and immediately evaporate. However, we discovered something pretty amazing just four weeks ago that was announced that the SOFIA mission, which is a telescope that's based inside of a Boeing, flies up in the atmosphere and it observes the moon. And it has found water molecules on a sunlit surface of the moon. So this is pretty amazing. This actually shows that water molecules are more common on the moon than we thought. Now I'm specifically saying water molecules. This is not liquid water. These are molecules of water and it's pretty spread out. So it's not something we'd be able to drink. However, there's quite a bit of it. So there's about enough to fill a 12 ounce bottle every cubic meter of soil. So you'd have to farm that water out of the soil to be able to use it. But this is very important, especially because we plan on going back to the moon pretty soon for a lot of incredible missions. And using the moon's natural resources is gonna be a big part of that. So that is a pretty incredible find. So looking at other planets around us, we can see kind of the history of terrestrial planets and what oceans might have been like on them. So Mars, for one, is a planet that we have a lot of evidence showing that it did have global oceans. Most of Mars used to be covered by oceans, very similar to how Earth is now. However, one important thing about keeping oceans is that you need to protect the oceans from solar winds and solar radiation. Or otherwise, your oceans will evaporate and the solar winds will actually carry the water molecules out into space. So Mars became magnetically dead a while ago, billions of years ago. And so we don't have a magnetic field to protect us from solar, or they don't have a magnetic field to protect them from solar winds. And because of that, uh, it's lost most of its water, its surface water. And it actually is losing its atmosphere as well. Mars does still have an atmosphere, but it is losing it at a tremendous rate. So about 400 kilograms per hour. That's per hour. And on a global scale, that still means a lot, but you gotta remember 400 kilograms for the whole entire globe per hour, not as much as you would think, but it's still losing its atmosphere. So it has lost about 87% of the water that it did have on its surface. However, we have been finding more and more water on Mars as well. So we already knew that uh, Mars had water because we can see it in its ice caps. We can see frozen H2O in its ice caps. So it's not liquid water, it's frozen. But now we're actually seeing evidence of water actually flowing on the surface. So this is liquid water. This is the kind of water that's very useful for anyone who wants to survive on a foreign planet. And it happens usually during a Martian summer. So Mars does go through seasons just like Earth does. And in a Martian summer, the equator area does warm up more. And we think there's a lot of frozen water underneath the surface of Mars. So this will 
actually, when it goes into summer, will heat up that water and cause it to flow down some of the hillsides we see on Mars. And we do have photographic evidence of that. So this is not something we have evidence of through spectrometry, spectroscopy or anything like that. This is photographic evidence we have of liquid water flowing down hillsides of Mars. And this is not water you might want to drink. This is very brackish water. It's very dirty water, almost sludge-like, but also very, very important because that water can be purified for our Mars crew that finally makes it to the surface of the planet, hopefully in within the next decade. So Mars is one example about what could be the future of our planet as well. We could take a look at a world that was an ocean world and see where it might go. Venus is another example. So Venus, something else happened. It's pretty similar to Mars as in it did lose its magnetic field. So it lost the protection of its magnetic field from the solar winds. And this did affect it in losing its H2O. But another thing happened was a greenhouse effect. It's a actually runaway greenhouse effect. So if you look at these images I have on my slide, on the top you see a visual image of Venus as it looks if you're just orbiting around it and looking down at it. So what you see is actually cloud tops. You see the outer atmosphere of Venus. The image below is a radar image of Venus taken so you peer through the clouds and look at the surface of Venus. Venus is extremely hot. Venus is almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit on its surface. That's hot enough to melt lead. And that heat is evaporated all of its oceans into the atmosphere. And then when it lost its magnetic field, the solar winds stripped that H2O out of the atmosphere and into space. So the effect of these two uh, events has caused Venus to lose its its water. And it used to be, it might have even been the first water world in our solar system. So when the sun was a little cooler in the early solar system, Venus, uh, being about the size of Earth, probably would have been a very immense water world. But now it's gone through quite a bit of changes. And it's something that we have to keep an eye on and study because could be within the realm that this could possibly happen to Earth as well, especially with the runaway greenhouse effect. So as Venus's oceans start evaporating and going up into its atmosphere, that takes the greenhouse effect and expands it, making it hotter, making it uh, evaporate more ocean and more water into the atmosphere. And that's how you get the runaway effect. So it's very important for us to keep studying Venus to take a look at how this process really happened and definitely try to avoid it for our own home planet Earth. Okay, so those are the inner planets. So now I want to take us a little bit further. One thing I want to mention is there's something called the habitable zone around stars. And the habitable zone is where you are just close enough to your star and that right temperature range where you could have liquid water. And that's what we think is going to be necessary for life as we know it. So you can't be too close to the sun. Otherwise you get too hot and you become a planet similar to Venus and even closer to the sun is Mercury, which has no atmosphere and can't have any liquid water on it because it evaporates immediately. So that's gonna to be too close. That's gonna be in the red zone. If you go too far away from your star, you get too cold and then the water just freezes. So you don't have any liquid water there because it all turned to ice. So that's gonna be in the blue zone. And right between those zones is going to be the habitable zone, or what we like to call the Goldilocks zone, because it's not too hot, not too cold, but just right for liquid water to exist on the surface. So for the longest time, we had the theory that that's really the only place that we could possibly have life exist, is if you need liquid water in that habitable zone. But there's some interesting things we're discovering about our own solar system let alone other solar systems that we're finding around other stars. And we're finding these ice worlds that actually have subsurface oceans, even more liquid water than Earth has. Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, is about five times the distance that Earth is to our sun. So it is in the blue zone, in the too cold zone. However, Europa, actually has more liquid water, about twice as much liquid water than Earth does. So how could that happen? 
How could it get enough warmth to keep that water liquid? Well, that happens because of tidal flexing. So here we see a little animation of Europa as it's orbiting around its parent planet, Jupiter. Jupiter is the most massive planet, so it has a lot of gravitational pull, a lot of tidal energy around it. And Europa is not in a perfectly circular orbit, so in its orbit, as it goes around, um, which is a pretty eccentric orbit, and it goes around by every 85 hours, so it's going around very fast, it actually flexes as it gets closer to Jupiter, that gravity on Jupiter will pull it a little bit more, so it'll flex it out a little bit, and then as it gets further away, it'll flex in. So it's actually this flexing motion that we see in this animation that's causing enough frictional energy that in turn actually heats up this moon enough for it to keep liquid water underneath the surface. So of course, it is out very far away from the sun. So the outer surface of this moon is actually ice, very cold ice. Here we can see a little animation um, or a little graphic of the earth on the right here and the amount of water that makes up the earth or the earth has on it. And then here is Europa and the amount of water that Europa has on it. So Europa is a, a pretty small moon, um, pretty similar to the size of our moon actually. And uh, it's got twice as much water as earth does on it. So this creates some pretty interesting effects. We've never been to the surface of Europa. So how do we know it has liquid water underneath the ice crust? Well, there's a couple different things that we have done to discover this. And one of it is looking at the magnetic field around Europa. Jupiter is a very large planet. It does have its own magnetic field, which is huge. And inside the magnetic field is where Europa orbits. So as Europa is orbiting within the magnetic field around Jupiter, it does this interesting thing and it actually induces its own magnetic field as it's moving around. And the only way that can really happen is if it had some kind of conducting material on it to create its own magnetic field like that. So looking at all the magnetic field lines that we've discovered on there using uh, different uh, spacecraft like the Voyager spacecraft and the Galileo spacecraft, we've measured the magnetic field and Using um, computer models, we've actually discovered that the best model that fits is if it has liquid water as the conductor. Salty liquid water, very similar to Earth's oceans. And it can't be inside the interior of this moon. It had to be somewhere on the outer parts of the moon. So pretty much just underneath that ice surface. So this is one of the pieces of evidence that made us pretty sure there's definitely liquid ocean underneath. and how massive that liquid ocean would be. Other evidence we have is the visual evidence we have. So we've taken many, many images of the surface of Europa using ground-based telescopes here on Earth, like the Kep telescopes, or space-based telescopes like Hubble, and using the spacecraft orbiting around Jupiter to take a look at it. So this image is actually composed from images taken by the Galileo spacecraft um, about 20 years ago, I believe. And you can see here, there's these interesting ridges forming. So the surface of this moon is pretty incredible. It's got a lot of interesting features that cannot be explained by just normal solar system formation. So we take a look at our moon, we see a moon that's heavily cratered. Craters are actually a sign of how old a surface is because we had a couple periods in our solar system uh, which are known as bombardment periods, and the late heavy bombardment happened billions of years ago, and that's where most of these craters formed. And if a surface does not show very many craters, it means that that surface has been able to repave itself. In order to do that, it has to be geologically active somehow. So here we actually see that this ice moon has been repaving itself through uh, ice tectonics is the term I'm gonna use. Basically, because of the liquid ocean underneath this surface, that liquid ocean is flowing and it cracks the surface of that ice 
And then that liquid or the warmer ice and water comes up from that and starts freezing as it comes to the surface, which is cooler than underneath. So we see very interesting cracks like this as well. We see things known as bands. So if you look here, we see these ridges and these bands are something that happens when you have the convection underneath the ice and it slowly pulls it apart and slowly starts refreezing. And then we even see subduction zones where these ice plates start crashing into each other and one ice plate is going underneath the other ice plate. So a surface ice is very, very cold. It is so cold, it is about as hard as granite. But below the surface, there's still more ice, but the ice starts to get warmer and starts becoming more able to flow and move, more malleable. And that's more similar to the glacial ice we see here on Earth. So we see our glaciers actually flow down our mountains away from our ice sheets. And we can see similar types of motions here on Europa. Another thing we see is the impact craters on Europa don't look like the same impact craters we'd see on our own moon. What happens is they kind of tend to collapse on themselves. So when there is an impact on the surface of this moon, you see the, the crater, but it tends to kind of fold in on itself because the softer ice underneath doesn't keep the, uh, the ridges from that crater um, holding too long. So because of that soft, warm ice, the craters tend to collapse, and we can see that on these craters here in these images. So all of that evidence kind of leads us to what it would look like underneath the surface of Europa. So here in image on the left-hand side, we see kind of a cross-section of what it would look like from the subsurface rocky uh, bottom of the ocean on Europa. Then we have miles of, of liquid ocean, and then we have kilometers of ice on the top. So because of the tidal flexing, that rocky body, which makes up the main core of this moon, is warm and releases heat into the ice and the water above it. And here we can see the warm flowing ice um, interacting with the cold stiff ice here and causing these interesting features we see on the surface. So this is uh, an animation made um, by a geologist who works at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory about how this convection underneath the surface of Europa can actually cause exactly the surface features we see. So here we see the heat, the white heat would be similar to like the, the heated water from the very bottom of the oceans on Europa. And um, so this area here, the blue area is not going to be liquid water. This is actually going to be the warm, malleable ice. Then we have the very cold ice up on the top here. And the very top layer, that white layer is going to be the crust, so the very top of Europa. And then we can see here, because of the convection in this ice, and keep an eye on how much time is passing here. So this is ice flowing, not liquid flowing. So this is ice slowly moving, and it does take thousands of years for these features to grow. But this is a mathematical example about how that can happen. All right, go into the next slide. Another thing that we have been observing pretty recently, um, which is some of the most in-your-face evidence that we've seen that there is definitely liquid water underneath that surface, is these plumes. So we have uh, observed evidence from ground-based telescopes. If you look on the left-hand side here, the ground-based telescopes um, of course, so we're so far away from Europa that they don't have the best resolution, but they have been able to detect water molecules in plumes right on the surface of Europa. So just coming off the surface here. So on the right-hand side here, that's going to be an artist interpretation. But this is the evidence we do have. So this is very big evidence showing that we do have liquid warm water coming up and exploding out of that icy crust that we have on Europa. So looking at this, we can actually take a look at what we think might be underneath the surface of Europa. So that's a lot of evidence from a lot of different um, areas that we have leading us to the same conclusion. And that is that there's possibly 
even a lot of thermal energy, enough thermal energy to actually have these thermal vents at the very bottom of the ocean of Europa. On the right-hand side here, we see some video from NOAA, which is taken from the subsea vents, the hydrothermal vents on our own planet. And what we're looking at is something that could be absolutely similar to what's going on in Europa. Another interesting thing about this is there's a lot of evidence also showing that this might be where life started on Earth. So when we have this exact same scenario happening on another body in our own solar system, it's not too difficult to think that there definitely is a possibility that life could be starting off or even evolving on this body, on this moon of Jupiter. So if we take a look at this artist's interpretation on the left-hand side here, we see the rocky bottom that is definitely heated from those tidal frictions and that heat has to escape somehow. So you get these subsurface hydrothermal vents coming up into the salty water, very, very similar to Earth's oceans. And even down here, this far away from the sun, you don't really need a lot of solar energy to feed life. You can use this thermal energy to feed life, very similar to the very, very bottom of Earth's ocean. So we have pretty much all the ingredients that we believe you need for life to happen. We have water, more water than Earth does, we have the essential elements. We have those hydrocarbons coming from these uh, thermal vents. We have the chemical energy from below and from above. So we have uh, energy coming from tidal frictions around Jupiter as well as the magnetic fields around Jupiter. And we have the, the stability. So you gotta give life time. And Europe has pretty much been simmering for about 4 billion years, so it's definitely had this ability. So now what do we do? We think this body might be able to sustain life, possibly even have life on it. What are we gonna do next? Well, of course we're gonna go explore it. So this is a mission that I'm very excited about. This is the Europa Clipper. So we've only been able to do some flybys of Europa so far. We haven't studied it specifically. We've only been studying it uh, as long as we have been studying Jupiter. So when we have a spacecraft orbiting Jupiter, we can use that spacecraft to also study the moons of Jupiter. But this Europa Clipper is gonna be specifically looking at Europa and specifically looking at signs of life on there too. So this next couple of slides I've actually borrowed from Robert uh, Papalardo, who's from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech. And uh, he has an incredible presentation that is available for you to view at the NASA Night Sky Network. And it was a webinar posted just about four weeks ago. So if you want more in depth about the, the Europa Clipper mission, you could definitely look at that. It's a great presentation. So I just borrowed a couple slides just to kind of show you guys what is in store for the next um, mission to Europa. So this slide here is actually showing uh, what the instruments of the, the Europa Clipper are going to be studying. So we have mass specs, which is a spectrometer. So it's going to be, uh, they like to use the word sniffing. It's going to be um, looking at what the composition of the atmosphere. So potentially those plumes off of Europa are gonna be looking at. There is uh, the surface or the SUDA, which is a dust analyzer. So we'll be taking surface and plume compos compositions and looking at what those are composed of. Ice mag, which is magnetometer, so it's going to be looking at the different magnetic field variations and sensing perhaps ocean properties. Uh, there's PIMS, which is a plasma environment. Europa UVS, which is a ultraviolet spectrograph. It has a narrow angle camera, so uh, we'll be able to take uh, landscape photos, 3D and in color. And it has ethemis, which is going to be a thermal imager, so we'll be able to tell the difference of the heat signatures on the surface of Europa. We have MISE, which is infrared spectrometer. So look at the chemical fingerprints. And REASON, which is a penetrating radar. We'll be able to actually penetrate underneath the surface of the ice shell to look at what's underneath there and look at potentially the ocean and the different layers of ice. So the Europa Clipper is not going to be landing on the surface of Europa, but it's gonna be doing a series of flybys. 
So it's going to be flying by quite a bit. And even at some points getting as close to 16 miles off of the surface to be able to look at all the features of the surface and using that radar to detect things underneath the surface. So here is a map of what the uh, flybys are gonna look like as well. And here's another global map of the flybys too. So it'll be actually orbiting around Jupiter and doing a lot of flybys around Europa. And in order to do this, it actually um, needs to do this to protect itself from the high radiation so it'll be doing these series of orbits to minimize how much radiation it gets exposed to. So I am really looking forward to seeing the results of this study. Of course, uh, it's not gonna be um, launching until I believe before 2030. So within the next 10 years, it's gonna be launching. It does not have a set launch date yet but I'm gonna be very excited to see what's happening with that. So that's the one I'm most interested in. But of course, Europa is not the only place in our own solar system that might have liquid water oceans. There's other moons of Jupiter. Jupiter has lots of moons. And two of the other moons in particular are very interesting. Ganymede, which is the largest moon of our solar system, bigger even than the planet of Mercury, has its own magnetic field. It's actually the only moon with its own magnetic field that's not induced by moving through another magnetic field like Europa is. And recent studies have actually shown that it definitely has some similar features on the surface of cracking like we see on Europa that could be caused by liquid ocean underneath. But it might be, this moon is so big, it might be that there is multiple layers of liquid water and ice. So kind of like a layered cake. It wouldn't be just one big ocean underneath an ice crust like Europa is, it'd be several layers. So we're not quite sure about how that would lead to its habitability, but it's something we're definitely looking at. And if we look at the other next moon of Jupiter, uh, we have Callisto. Callisto is very similar to the size of Ganymede, so it's a very large moon. This surface is a little bit different too. So on here we can see lots of craters, which means the surface is a little bit older, so those craters have lasted a lot longer. However, we still believe that there is an ocean about six miles deep underneath this ice, but we also believe that the ice crust on this moon could be about 124 miles thick, so it's a very thick ice crust before we get to about six miles of ocean underneath it. So it's another one we need to explore more about too. So those are... Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Jessica asks, and this skips back a couple steps, but yeah. will Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity make the Europa Clippers mission difficult, or can you speak to that at all? Actually, Jupiter's gravity is going to be helping the Europa mission a lot. So the Europa mission is actually going to be using Jupiter's gravity to stay in its orbit, and once it's getting into that orbit, it won't have to use a lot of fuel because as it's orbiting around the big planet of Jupiter, it gets in a stable enough orbit that, that Jupiter's gravity will keep it right where it needs to be. So it actually saves it on a lot of fuel and helps it out in its mission. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? All right, we'll keep going. So now we're gonna go even a little bit further out, even where it's even colder. And uh, that's going to be around the planet of Saturn and to this very spectacular moon called Enceladus. Enceladus is incredible. So look at this image here. You can see just how beautiful this moon is. And you can see a lot of that cracking along the surface here as well. And also, not very many comet, or sorry, impact craters. So we see on here only about four impact craters. Oh, there's more down in the southern area here, but that means again that the surface of Enceladus is young, which means it's been repaving itself, which means there's a lot of motion and activity going on. So Enceladus is also believed to have a ocean underneath its ice crust. Now this is even more interesting because now we're twice the distance from the sun that Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are. We are 10 times out here past 
more distance to the sun than Earth is. So light out here is a hundredth as bright as it is on Earth. So we get like a hundredth of the heat energy from the sun that we would on Earth. So it's cold. It's very cold out here. So how can we have another moon, of course, with these interesting features such as these jets of water that shoot out? We've actually captured this, these jets shooting out from Earth. These jets are shooting out a lot of water, and it's warm water. Well, out here, it'd be considered very hot, um, but it's, it's still a very cold part of the solar system. So the Cassini mission, which has been flying around you, or Saturn, has been studying Enceladus because of these very interesting features. We believe that there is about a six mile deep ocean, and the crust of Enceladus should only be about 20 to 25 miles thick, so not nearly as thick as the crust of Callisto. So this is thin enough where it can actually have fissures on the surface, and out of those fissures we see hot water, quote unquote hot, spewing out. And because of the Cassini mission was already out here exploring this, it was able to do a flyby close enough to the surface of Enceladus to grab some of this hot spray from these fissures and test it, sniff it to see what kind of compounds were in there. And we found, of course, H2O and other minerals necessary for life. So it definitely has the seeds for life out here, even 10 times the distance from Earth than our own Earth, from the sun than our own Earth. So Enceladus is an incredible moon as well. And the Cassini mission is, of course, over now, but I believe they're planning on doing another mission pretty soon to Jupiter to look at Enceladus even more. Another incredible moon, also around Jupiter, is the moon Titan. So Titan, right next to Europa, is probably my favorite moon of the solar system. And that's because this is almost a weird, like, funhouse image of Earth. Things are just all a little bit off, but it still has the same features as Earth does. So this image here is an image of Titan. This is a real image, and it's taken of Titan as we see here. You're only looking at the hazy atmosphere. This moon has a thick atmosphere, and it's a big moon too. Not quite as big as Ganymede, but a very big moon. And when we peer through the atmosphere of Titan, it's got a thick atmosphere, we can see some very interesting features. We see lakes and streams and coastlines, and we see mountains and shorelines, and we see rain, we see snow, we see a lot of things you would see on Earth. But out here, it's too cold for liquid water to exist on the surface. So this image right you see to the right here, that is not liquid H2O. The liquid on the surface of this moon is mostly made out of methane and ethane. Very cold, so cold out here that these gases turn to liquid. So it is not something we would really, when we look at life as we know it on Earth, we could not survive here. We'd have to look at potentially a whole different kind of life existing to be able to exist on the surface of this moon. However, the surface of this moon, all the rocky, quote unquote, rocky parts, the mountains and the, the crust of it is actually made mostly of water ice. And it is so hard, it's about as hard as granite, very similar to the other moons. But underneath all that, there might be liquid H2O as well, because this moon is getting those tidal frictions from Jupiter, or sorry, Saturn, which of course is another very large planet. So there's two different types of scenarios happening on this moon that could potentially support life. Potentially it could support life that needs water to survive, like life as we know here on Earth, or potentially some kind of life that might have evolved using liquid methane and ethane. Interesting, very interesting. So one cool thing about Titan is that this is the furthest we've actually ever landed on an object. 
The Cassini mission had a probe called the Huygens probe, and it landed on the surface of Titan. And we can actually see exactly what that looks like here. So I have this video for you that I'm going to play. And let me just check to see how much time you have left. Okay, so this video is about four and a half minutes long, and I tried to find a shorter video. Um, but it's just so incredible. I wanted to share this guys with you guys. So this will talk about the Huygens mission, which is back in 2005, I believe. And it'll actually show it landing on the surface of this incredible moon. January 14th, 2005 begins with the Earth passing directly in between the Sun and Saturn, an opposition so perfect that it occurs maybe twice per millennium. Meanwhile, the Huygens probe, quietly entering the Saturnian system, is about to end its seven-year journey. As Huygens approaches, the inner planets cluster around the distant Sun. Saturn appears almost as large as Orion. A few moons are visible as white dots aligned with Saturn's rings, while Titan, its largest moon, is already well resolved. Huygens is destined for Titan, a mysterious world larger than the planet Mercury and shrouded by a thick brownish-orange atmosphere. The details of its surface have never been seen. Huygens' speed increases to near 6 kilometers per second, and Titan's disk quickly obscures our view of Saturn and its more intimate moon. As the probe enters Titan's atmosphere, the heat shield reduces the speed some 15-fold within a few minutes. The main parachute reduces the speed further. Fifteen minutes later, the smaller stabilizer chute allows a faster descent at first, but slows as Huygens enters the lower, denser parts of Titan's atmosphere. Huygens is approaching a dark valley between brighter, hilly regions. Beyond the hills to the left, two dark parallel lines appear, which are later discovered to be part of a vast system of dunes which surround the moon. At 21 kilometers altitude, the probe moves through a thin haze layer as seen on the horizon. The bright area near the center top is the glow of Titan's haze illuminated by the sun. A complicated system of drainage channels, some hundreds of meters wide and kilometers long, are seen cut into the hillside. These are probably the result of runoff from methane rain. Stereographic imagery reveals hills to the left to be perhaps a few hundred meters tall, while features in the valley are tens of meters in height. For most of the descent, the probe travels eastward above Titan's surface. However, below seven kilometers altitude, motion reverses into a backward westward motion. It reverses again at one kilometer altitude and we move slowly southeastward. Hang on as Huygens lands on Titan's surface near a water ice outcropping ridge. Another westward looking view of the descent from 31 kilometers shows the area of Titan over which the probe has just flown. This affords us a good view of the drainage channels and apparent shoreline. Four dark lowlands appear and a rough pitted hillside to the left. Spectra of the surface suggest that the bright areas are water ice. The darker areas are a type of hydrocarbon mixture that has never been produced. The small white dot in the lower center part of sea is our progress over Titan. We fly over the ridge near where we will land. As we approach the surface, our perspective brings the topography to life. We see that although there are rivers and a shoreline, the basin is dry. Below, there are distinct signs of erosion which crept in the rugged ridgeline. Huygens sinks into one of these gullies. We experience a relatively soft landing on Titan's surface. The view from the surface reveals an amazingly Earth-like picture of a dry riverbed with distant hills which are a few meters in height. Some seconds after impact, the shadow of Huygens' parachute drifts across the sea. The heat from the surface science lamp and the probe's skin vaporizes methane from Titan's surface, which is about 180 centigrade degrees below freezing. Near the probe, the ground is littered with water ice rocks and smaller pebbles, which could be made of water ice or hydrocarbons or some combination thereof. Although we now know more than ever about this mysterious world, many questions remain unanswered. 
Where is the vast reservoir of liquid methane necessary to replenish the atmosphere? Where and how often does it rain on Titan? How does the methane get recirculated into the atmosphere? What materials make up the surface? What processes create and shape the hills, dunes, and valleys? All right, that's just so incredible every time I watch it. January 14th. Oh, let's go ahead and move past that. Okay, so of course that was back in 2005 that the Huygens probe landed on the surface of Titan. Uh, but that's not the end of our exploration of this amazing world. Uh, pretty soon we're going to have another mission which just got approved from NASA, and that is the Dragonfly mission to Titan. So this is going to be pretty exciting. It's going to be another lander on this moon's surface, but this time it's got uh, propellers which will enable it to move to different areas on the surface. So it'll be able to explore dozens of sites on the surface of Titan. And this time it's equipped with a drill even, so it can actually drill into the surface and test what the chemistry is like and potentially uh, the habitability of Titan as well. This one's not scheduled to launch until about 2026. And of course, all the way out here around the orbit of Saturn, it takes some time to get out there. And so it's probably not gonna be arriving around Saturn or Titan until about 2034. So that's another mission to really look forward to. Okay, um, I don't have much time left, so uh, I do want to briefly mention, of course, this was an exploration of the water world in our solar system, which is what we've gathered the most information about, of course, because it is closer, <laughs> even though these bodies are very far away from Earth. They're close enough for actually us to send probes to and discover more about them. But we're discovering more and more about even other solar systems with other worlds around them too. In fact, in a recent study by Goddard, they looked at 52 low mass exoplanets. So when they say low mass, uh, they're looking at something that's more similar to around Earth size, but generally around Earth size. So this is gonna be oh, like 10 times the size of Earth to about the size of Earth. Um, and we're looking for low mass because that would also mean that they're not as rocky, they have more gases and perhaps more liquid on there. So they found that out of these 52 planets that they were looking at, about one third of them were ocean worlds. That's a big number. And about half of those ocean worlds were ice worlds that have the subsurface ocean that we see on quite a bit of the moons in the outer part of our solar system. So as we are still discovering more and more planets around other stars on a weekly basis, we have so much information that we're getting from all of this that we have to look at the potential of habitability in very narrow terms and we basically just need to start somewhere. So we're starting with what we know already. We're starting with what allows life to happen on Earth, which is something about the size of Earth around a star similar to the size of our star and in that special habitable zone, which is just close enough, not too far away for it to have liquid water. So we're narrowing our search down to call that the habitable planets that might be habitable. But as we discover more about the other objects in our solar system, especially the moons that I've mentioned today, it could be a lot more bodies in all these different solar systems have the potential to harbor life, not just Earth-like planets around a sun-like star in the habitable zone of their star. So the possibilities are almost endless out there. And of course, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, the study of exoplanets has only recently begun. Um, 1995 is when we first discovered an exo extrasolar planet, and the fields of astrogeology and astrobiology, looking for the geology around these planets, looking for potential life signs around these planets, is a very new field that's taking incredible leaps in studies every day. So it's an incredible area of study right now. And if you guys are interested in more of that stuff, I have a couple of resources that I'm putting up here. So uh, we do have the solarsystem.nasa.gov is a great thing to do, or a great place to go to look at more of these resources. And they particularly have uh, one resource that is just about ocean worlds. So you can discover more about the ocean worlds I talked about here, or even about those extrasolar planets. Um, 
that I briefly talked about at the very end there. And then if you're interested, um, NASCA's Night Sky Network, um, the second uh, link here has some amazing webinars that they've put up where you can see the people who are actually working on these projects talk in depth about what they're gonna do, what they're gonna research, like the Europa Clipper and the uh, Titan Dragonfly. And um, also, of course, uh, if you wanna learn more about the UA Planetarium, we also do some talks about other astronomical uh, subjects. So you can follow us on Facebook as well. And I wanna thank the Eagle River Nature Center very much for hosting. And thank you, Samantha, for letting me come here and talk. All right, um, any questions? I'm seeing a lot of thank yous. This is amazing coming up in the comment section. Thank you. Yeah. Even more thank yous. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Omega, for taking the time and for continuing to be a part of the Nature Center Astronomy Series. And we hope we'll have you talk again in 2021. Absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe in person. Right? Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. Everyone have a great weekend. Stay safe out there and we hope you get outside. <laughs>